Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome everyone to the first uh, presentation in, on day three of this ATAPI Tech Talks conference, which has, I think, been really had some really fascinating talks so far. I think this one's going to be very, very fascinating. I'm certainly keen to keen to hear it. Um, I had a little chat with the presenters last week, and um, yeah, the promise is is really amazing in this this system it's uh, a different approach to just generating a font than than previous things we've seen in parametric fonts and so on so this uses uh, ai techniques of gan uh, so i'll introduce uh, kai ben now he's a professor of type design at ecal in lausanne Hello. Um, next is matthew matthew Cotta. He's the head of uh, the Master's Type Design, also Ekal Lausanne. We have Shuhui Shi, uh, the China Academy Hello. of Art uh, in, uh, in Hangzhou near Shanghai. And uh, we also have Wang Wei from the University of Trento. Um, you, one of you can remind me what GAN stands for. I apologize for that, uh, that uh, mental lapse. Okay, uh, the, it, it means generative adversary network, and we will talk about it later. Okay, um, I think with that, we'll just get started then. So I'll invite you to press play on the, your presentation. So, yes, yes, okay, thank you, Lorenz. So, I met you, Gotta. I will just <clears throat> quickly introduce the whole context of this project uh, before leaving. Uh, Xu Hui and Wei were both were the most involved people in it. Um, so um, this project started at uh, ECAL, University of Art and Design in Lausanne, um, where there is a master in type design. And since 12 years, the, the school um, can lead a research project, which can take many different forms. Uh, some are technical or technological like this one, but it could be also historical tech, uh, questions or more graphical approaches. Uh, as here you can see the Maximage color combination uh, project. So uh, it started uh, as a diploma project in the MA, in the second year of the MA, and Shuhui got in touch with uh, EPFL, uh, engineering school also uh, near Lausanne, uh, to seeking for collaboration on her project. And so she made contact with the computer vision laboratory and uh, Mathieu Salzman that uh, gave uh, the opportunity to collaborate on this and brings the uh, other approach. Um, the project was then, uh, uh, well, I mean, both Shuhui and Wei worked on it um, during the year 2020 with supervision of uh, Kai Bernau. And uh, we're all going to, to introduce different perspectives on, on this question. Uh, starting with uh, Shu Hui, I leave you the stage. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Shu Hui. Uh, well, I, actually, I never thought of being a really Chinese type designer before this IC project. I was interested in drawing logo types or letterings in Chinese, but never a typeface, because I know once I started the first Hanzi, and there will be another 6,000 ones waiting for me. And uh, for example, here, uh, these two images are from Dr. Wang Xuan. Uh, he's, when he started to digitize Hanzi in the computer in the 1970s, uh, just one single Hanzi character, it would take this kind of work to do it. So it, the Hanzi design starts from like a, a collaboration, more like a teamwork, and still it is still teamwork till today because there are actually very few uh, independent Chinese type designers nowadays. Usually people choose to make typeface together as a uh, teamwork. So, um, Kai? Okay. 
And uh, so in order to change this situation and me myself a uh, really Chinese type designer, I started the Ai Zi project. The name of the project could be written as Ai Zi or Ai Zi or Ai Zi. Actually, they have the same pronunciation, but and the meaning it actually is quite directly as well. It's just uh, AI generated Hanzi, as you see. And the last one, Ai Zi, just means the uh, love of Hanzi and type design. So then I gather some information about AI or what we say machine learning in the aspect of uh, image processing. Uh, through my research, some existing projects show the uh, possibilities of uh, generating Hanzi. Uh, for example, here, this is the Zi Tu Zi project. It shows us the most uh, classic way to generate uh, a, a Chinese AI typeface is to have some Hanzi around uh, 700 to 800 as an input and transfer them into images then using again the network we explained before and maybe later to train and learn the style of the typeface then apply the style again to the rest of the typeface so in this way Hanzi will be treated like uh, images so the output is also image here we can see a very early result of, of our uh, IC network generated in a very early stage. Like the left one is uh, human generated hands and the right one is the machine generated hands. We can see the difference. Um, because we all know like uh, there's difference between a uh, human vector drawing letter shapes and uh, and uh, auto tracing and uh, uh, the AI generated one is more like a softener auto tracing hands but uh, the thing is uh, hands it requires some characteristics like uh, it should be straight and plain. So because of that, most of the existing projects, they're usually more focusing on the calligraphic styles because in that way, it's way easier to generate. For the body text styles, it's just harder because it couldn't really achieve that stage so far. So uh, that's introducing a little bit of uh, what we expected, like, uh, Gun. So in the beginning of the early research, I had a great expectation of machine learning because of the success of AlphaGo. It proved to the world that uh, machine can finally beat human, at least in the Go game. Also, there are some very good examples showing the power of style transfer under the GAN network in image processing, especially in face identification, like uh, this example shows. Uh, this project is called This Person Does Not Exist. It's a website, like every time when you refresh the website, then you get a fresh new generated human image. So what is scan and uh, can it truly help us to do uh, type design or Chinese type design? I will lead the way to introduce you to it. Okay, uh, now I'm going to briefly introduce what is scan and how it works. Uh, as you can see the, in this figure, uh, GAN, the full name of GAN is a Generative Adversary Network. Uh, and it consists of two main models. One is the generator model, as you can see in the uh, top, and one discriminator model, uh, which is located at the bottom. So these two, mo uh, these two models, um, they work together. Uh, the generator, it learns to generate fake images, uh, and uh, the fake image together with the real image will be put, uh, will be fed to the discriminator model. And then the discriminator model will tell uh, which which one is fake and which one is real. And then it will have some feedback to the generator. And then the generator uh, tries to improve itself and tries to generate more realistic looking images. And now I'm going to show you uh, a, a small video. 
to see how the generated images evolve during the training uh, process. As you can see here, in the right beginning, the generator can uh, only generate noisy images. Uh, as the training keep going, it can generate more and more realistic looking images. Uh, in this case, it's the digits. Um, actually, uh, it has the two models, the generator and the disk miner, that fight against each other. Um, uh, now let's pretend the disk miner um, as a police officer who tries to support the, um, uh, the counterfeit money while the generator is a counterfeiter who learns uh, how to create fake money. So in the first round, the generator will create prosthetic forgeries that don't look real at all. Um, then at this point, the discriminator can easily tell, okay, this is fake dollar because, uh, because it doesn't have a face on it. Then um, this discriminator will give this feedback to the generator and then the generator knows that, oh, I need to put a, a, a face on the, uh, on the bill, then it looks more real. So um, then the generator improves itself and uh, generate uh, better, uh, uh, better images that looks more realistic. And then this game uh, continues um, and continues for many, many times. And then finally, the generator can produce very, very good quality fake images that looks like real, uh, like, looks like real images. And uh, so it has a lot of applications. Mm. Now I'm going to introduce this part. It has a lot of applications, such as image to image uh, translation. So uh, it can transform, transform an input image to a synthetic image. As you can see here in this figure, the input is a real photo, and with this again, with this generative adversary network, you can translate it to different uh, images with different styles, such as the Monet, um, uh, Van Gogh. Uh, uh, sorry for my pronunciation of the, of the names, if I made uh, some mistake. Uh, and Cezanne and uh, Yukiwe. So these, uh, uh, you can translate the input images to, um, sorry, you can translate the images to different styles. And the only difference between this scan and the, 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 the standard one I, I introduced is that instead of telling the, uh, uh, whether the generated, generated image is a fake or not, it tells whether the generated image belongs to this style or not. So it's a simple modification of the generative adversary network. Then you can get this result. And what is, what is more fun is that it, it can do uh, uh, vice versa. It means that if you input the, the paint, it can also translate this paint into realistic looking images, translate them into photos. I can see here in this slide, uh, the input are the paints and the output are the real photos. So uh, it's, a, it's a very amazing and it is good at doing this job. Because for these um, paints and these photos, it's more like the textures, it's different from the font design where we, uh, it is very sensitive to the edges, to the shape, but for these um, uh, images, uh, uh, it cares more about the texture. So it is easier for the network to do the job. And uh, of course, there's another uh, application uh, of the GAN. This is uh, our recent work, which has been just uh, accepted by the top tie conference at, um, of computer vision. So what we can do here is uh, doing uh, interpolation. So here, as as uh, recall, uh, as you can recall in the right beginning, uh, when I introduced the, the generative adverse network, it, it can generate an image from a random ve uh, noise vector. So uh, imagine that you have two random vector in the beginning and at the, the, the rear. If you do interpolation between these two random vectors, the linear interpolation, and then you uh, generate the corresponding images, you can smoothly translate this uh, image from A to B. And you can generate the in between uh, in between images. Uh, for instance, from gender, you can generate uh, uh, you can slowly uh, slowly change the person from a female to a male, and in between you can hardly tell whether it is a male or female. And also you can uh, age the person slowly from uh, young to the old person, and also change the expression from a, spy, a smile to a neutral expression and also from a cat to dog. 
And the, the bottom line, you can also uh, uh, smoothly uh, uh, and change, the uh, change the image from a dog to a lion. And this is our uh, recent work. And the next, uh, we are going to introduce how it works for, uh, for our project. And I'll leave the stage to uh, Shu Hui. Hello. So um, how did it go? Um, so far for the IZ project itself, which reached achievements in both design and technology. First, as I said, in order to generate a very straight and plain body text Hanzi shape, we designed an algorithm to combine Hanzi by radicals or what we say component. Uh, here are the radical system of Hans. We can say we can see this is the logic like how Hans is designed in the in the beginning. Like we, we find one radical and there are the other Hans characters that is related to this radical. They share some similar meanings or like similar uh, pronunciations. So um, in this way. Uh, they are, as we find, also we found a very interesting coincidence, uh, like here. Uh, it is from the 19th century, uh, when the missionaries in that, at that time, like uh, uh, Machine Le Grand, actually he's, he has a Chinese name, it's uh, Li Guang. Uh, they want to publish uh, the Bible in Chinese. So they built this uh, very similar system called the divisible type. As you can see, this uh, book is actually published in Paris, I remember. And uh, some of the structure maybe looks a bit strange, but actually they are still readable because they couldn't at that time they couldn't find like a very proper way to uh, publish and. Uh, print uh, like a lot of Hanzi characters. So they also use a combining way like showing different uh, uh, radicals and components and combine them together. As we also had this uh, layout system. So in this layout system, we are going to combining different parts of the Hanzi and creating new characters. Here we have a database. That's everything we get, uh, we collect together in the end, uh, because there are only less than 300, 300 radicals in Chinese, but over 94,000 hands can be displayed in the computer. And most of the 90, 94,000 hands, and they are based on these uh, radicals. They can be generated by these radicals. So in our algorithm, that's all we need is uh, 300, 300 Hanzi radicals plus some more Hanzi that are not divisible as our input. Then we will generate something very ridiculous like this. Uh, they are just uh, combining very uh, kind of randomly, but uh, still a little bit readable for me, at least for me. Uh, the, so this uh, this so we have uh, this database. It, it contains as much as possible hands with uh, the divisible information. Like uh, we can see the layout or the components what we need for this uh, database. Uh, it is just uh, designed for type designers, like even if they don't speak Chinese, but they could have some reference to draw Hanzi. We spent lots of effort to create this uh, database because we couldn't find a very good existing one for a reference. But thankfully, with the help of uh, Chinese, uh, 15 Chinese students from CAA, finally, uh, we can have uh, they, they help us to do the proof rate of the uh, of the database now we have uh, this database it containing around uh, 90,000 of hands information and based on this information we can generate as much as hands we need and use this 
Hanzi to train and generate for the rest. So how how does our network works? I will ask a way to introduce you our model. Hi, guys. Uh, now I'm going to introduce how the um, network works. Um, as you can see that um, uh, we use the special transformer to do the job. So um, I'm sorry to introduce you these complex concepts uh, from the uh, perspective of a computer vision scientist. So, uh, <clears throat> but I will try my best to make it uh, easy to understand. So now I'm going to briefly introduce what is a fine transformation. So a fine transformation uh, operations include rotation, translation, and scaling. So uh, when you try to combine different uh, components of hands together to form the, um, the, the complete uh, character, you need to know uh, where we should localize it and what the size should, should be look like. And then uh, to do this job, we, re we rely on the uh, uh, um, um, affine transformation. And uh, as you can see in the figure, um, in order to learn the affine transformation, the network needs to have the prior knowledge of the original location and the size of each component. And then the uh, network can make a decision which component should be uh, located where. And to extract this uh, such information, which depends on the VGG19 network, as you can see in the figure left, uh, the input is uh, the input image has a resolution of around 250 times 250. You input the image to the VGG19 network, then it extracts the deep features. And the deep features can represent the size and uh, uh, shape, uh, this kind of information. And then you combine all this information together, you feed it to the network again, and then the network decide, ah, okay, uh, I'm going to uh, shrink this, uh, uh, the left part and put it a little bit left, and then do the similar thing for the right, uh, right part. And then they are concatenated together. Um, and then we do the loss between the generated, uh, generated image and the ground truth image. And then with this loss, we do the back propagation and uh, it's a, uh, the network learns to, to make better decisions. And as you can see in the figure right, uh, with more training epochs, uh, the um, the network can uh, better localize this um, this uh, body these components and uh, put it in the right position. So as you can see, um, uh, our network is a little bit sensitive to the to the re image resolution. When we use very large images, such as two hundred fifty times two hundred fifty, um, it's a little bit challenging for the network to to converge and to make accurate predictions. But if we uh, uh, scale it down to the resolution of 56 times 56, uh, it is more friendly to the, uh, to the network and it can learn more precisely where should I put each component where. And so this is how it works. And here's, uh, yeah, here's another example. And in the image, uh, the L, it means left, uh, the left component. R means the right component. O means uh, how it looks like uh, when we overlap them uh, to, uh, to each other. And the P represents the predicted output. And the G means the ground truth. And uh, well, as I explained in the previous slides, with more epochs, you can get better and more accurate uh, uh, positions of the different components. And uh, when you learn this, uh, when you learn these transformations from these smaller resolution images, you can transfer this affine transform transformation directly to the large resolution images, and it works perfectly. But still, you can see that um, the the strokes sometimes it needs to get thicker. Um, this is something the network couldn't do, and in our future work, we plan to use the generative adversity network again, best on this version, based on the current uh, characters we have, and to see if it can learn to uh, make the uh, sickness in a proper manner, uh, make it uh, more accurate, uh, et cetera. 
So uh, I guess that that's it for uh, for the special transformer uh, we have right now. And uh, next slides we will talk. Um, the, it's a relationship between AI and uh, the type design education. And I will leave stage to Matthew. Okay. Uh, probably for some part of the audience, you are in the same situation as me. You don't read Chinese, you don't speak Chinese, and all those engineering technical elements are ooh, quite mysterious. Um, but what uh, I was interested in in the project is that uh, the word learning comes a lot. And as a as type design educator, it really interests me how you we teach and or you learn type design. And so at Ical, we have every year one class specifically on one script that none of the students can read. Uh, they have to take it and to research on it and to design letter forms for that script. None of the students is able to read, including me. Uh, I mean, Chinese script, uh, we wish, I wish to you work on that script because it's really something interesting for even Latin designer to understand how it works. But so far, it was impossible due to the quantity of, of, uh, of glyphs to make just to uh, grasp a little bit of it. Um, so, but it was interesting uh, with, the, with the AI ID, because as said, for instance, uh, what, two years ago, we worked on Greek, it is one of the results, resulting fonts of this project. Um, I set myself, we, we have invited guests, of course, but I set myself in, in some position of what is the ignorant schoolmaster, uh, which is a concept uh, analyzed by, um, invented by Joseph Jacotot and analyzed by Jacques Rancière about how, how can you teach something you do not, you don't know. Uh, and basically, uh, the principle is that you work like a GAN. There is a generator, the student, producing content, and the teacher works as the discriminator. For instance, here is a slide from this year. We're working on Syriac script. And uh, so I, I do the job of the discriminator. Basically, I ask questions. Why this? Why this? Why not this? Et cetera, et cetera, to help the students finding the answers uh, by themselves. Um, so when it comes to Chinese, yeah, okay, there is a number issue. It's too big for to to to, to do this. But maybe um, maybe artificial intelligence can help. Uh, I also, in the same time, uh, speaking about Chinese scripts, I was really interested in the works of this author, Jean-François Billoté, uh, who is a sinologist living in Geneva. And he published several books. I mean, I started with this one uh, about the Chinese art of writing, but he published several books about translation, about uh, transmission of knowledge, let's say, including very recent books about the art of teaching Chinese and the movement, the, gest the, the gesture, the movement of Chinese, and how um, his, his way of teaching Chinese uh, was somehow uh, related to what uh, actually artificial intelligence is doing, with the limitation that for BOT, uh, artificial intelligence work with numbers, so is basically unlimited, whereas is working with uh, human beings who have bodies, and the body is limited. Uh, but for instance, you take the, the example of uh, when you are a child, you learn to pour water in, into a glass. Uh, it takes you enough energy. It's somehow painful. Uh, but you reach at some point, by doing it with your body, you reach at some point the, the, that you integrate the, the action. And then you never have to think about it again. You just do it. And you can even start to reflect about what you do when you pour water into a into a bottle. Basically, according to PET, the principle of learning is made of three steps, uh, which is first the acquisition of the technique. Everyone who plays any musical instrument knows this. You just repeat the technique. 
then study of masterpieces, which is apparently also in the, an important part in the traditional way of teaching Chinese uh, calligraphy. And then when you know it, you can emancipate and let your own personality emerge. Basically, that's the same thing that was expressed by Matthew Carter a few years ago during uh, a talk with different worlds, copying, imitating, and creating afterwards. Uh, I can see this on an everyday basics, basis uh, yeah, currently, because I have a child who is learning how to write. Uh, he's a, his travel plan, post-COVID travel plan, uh, he made like a couple of months ago, um, we're going to visit Oklahoma in 2025. And um, since it's already evolved a lot, we, we see the classical mistakes of children. But I realize how much this question of the body is in, important in his learning and how, how he processes. Uh, and basically, if you take any manual of uh, whatever the culture, any manual of, of uh, handwriting, calligraphy, and design, uh, like traditional manuals, it all goes with the posture, the position of the body, and how it goes like this. And so, another point also, which was interesting, relating to Aitze and um, the, the uh, Jean-François Billet's theories is, um, so we have the generator and the discriminator. discriminator. Um, the question, which is important, I think, in art and design in general, is the question of um, the author. Because now it's normal that we, when there is a new font created, it has to be original. And it's a key feature in our world today that uh, originality, originality matters. And this comes from a, a long history, um, uh, I mean, traditional way of producing art was by copying the masters. And I think for 16th century type designer, it was basically that. You look at the existing, you create based on this uh, by imitating with your own touch. Um, but uh, for instance, the notion of copyright was totally pointless. Um, but this, uh, it's a state of mind uh, within creation of the copyright with, for instance, the Grasse font, you can see here, which was the one, the first one named after its designer. Um, and the first possibly plagiarism, the role of uh, the personality or who is designing becomes Im very important. And nowadays you have people who refuse to design, to use some fonts, uh, no matter of the quality of the design, but because of the life of the designer. Uh, my question would be, with AI, there is no individual person. Could it make art a bit more like science? It's perfectly normal today that science discoveries are not made by individuals, uh, but by groups, sometimes a lot of people. Uh, what if art and design could become something like this, like the individual does not matter that much and it moves to another way of uh, another way of creating. Um, so this would need with, uh, with this we would need to reshape entirely the way we teach uh, type design. I, but I think it's an interesting uh, question, maybe to be discussed later. Um, but there is other question that are also raised from Aitsu project. And I will leave the stage to Kai. Could you take over, Kai, please? Yeah. Thank you, Mathieu. Hello. Uh, my name is Kai. Apart from teaching at the uh, ECAL, I also do some type design sometimes. And uh, I've, throughout this project, I have spent a lot of time thinking, so what does this mean for us, for type designers? Um, some of you may have seen this talk and have had dollar signs in their eyes and others may have been afraid that the robots are going to steal their jobs. Uh, and 
others still may see opportunities for greater equity in type design or computers that dream up letter shapes that have never been seen before. But the truth is almost everything that we do in type design is already aided by the computer from, you know, the way that we draw circles to the way that we interpolate typefaces to uh, potentially automatic spacing and kerning, if, if that's your thing, um, to build scripts to automatically generate your typefaces from some XML files that describe the whole design space. All of that is already done by computer programs. Um, the labor is done by computers. And what we do is just to make the decision. Our work is to decide what needs to be done. And the labor is done by the computer. So it makes sense that especially for scripts with huge character sets, the conservative designs, uh, the less experimental designs have prevailed um, in the past. And there has not been a, a vibrant, as in, uh, a, a, an independent scene as there has been in, in Europe. Um, so I have another question for Shuhui. Um, you also drew Latin type uh, uh, at the MATD program, and now you've done this project. Do you think that with current technology, it's worth creating an entire machine learning apparatus just for drawing these, you know, these ridiculously small character sets uh, that we have? And would it even work well? Okay. Uh, well, I saw some uh, projects about uh, AI-generated Latin typefaces during my research as well. Um, but I found that uh, at least these uh, existing projects are more focused on like the in-between images. Like when we also have this example from Aizi when we generated, this is actually uh, the, it's writing the typeface in Chinese. And the typeface, it, the, uh, the type of the typeface is totally generated by machine because, I mean, these shapes are very charming and fresh and uh, interesting for the designers or artists because, like, no human will ever think or draw in that way. That's more I found like most of the existing uh, Latin related uh, AI generating type, uh, typeface projects are about. But another another problem about this uh, is maybe because like um, Chinese, it has some um, natural tolerance about the shapes. For example, we are more caring about like the calligraphic styles. And sometimes when you draw in a calligraphic styles, you can only have like many, you can see many anchors everywhere. And sometimes if you want to remove some anchors, the spirit of the typeface even changed. Mm. So we can, we can tolerate like a bit of these blurred or softer shapes while machine generated, but maybe not for Latin because when I draw Latin typeface, it's always like a move from pixel to pixel. It's too precise, like it's pure and precise. So maybe can maybe AI can help for making some um, um, small tools. I don't know, maybe for kerning or something else, but not good at drawing. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Shui. So it's probably really a little bit like that AI can be a great help for Chinese and other character sets uh, and other scripts that have huge character sets because just like a democratization of the type design market already took place uh, through you know design software and digital technologies, well. The same thing can now happen for Chinese type with new software and digital technologies. So not so long ago, you needed huge machinery and large teams of people drawing in drawing offices in Salford or in Frankfurt. Uh, nowadays, you can get uh, type design software for maybe 300 euros or a little more if you want something professional. Uh, but 
in Beijing or in Hong Kong, you still need drawing offices full of people. Uh, but maybe soon you will be able to pay 300 euros or a little bit more for a style transform network that can repeat your design decisions from a few hundred glyphs to 50,000 characters or more. I think it's important to think about the limits of the GAN versus the limits of the designers and then optimize our own future a bit for that. Because right now, a GAN can only make new typefaces that are like the typefaces that it has been trained with. It tries to imitate what you feed it. So only by happenstance, glitches basically can occur uh, as machine imagination. But an ideal GAN will only produce more things like the one that it has seen. Uh, and a very nice example from a different uh, background is a song that made the rounds just a few weeks ago on the internet uh, that perfectly illustrates the state of the AI of sort of just using AI. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a new Nirvana song, 20, 27 years after uh, Kurt Cobain's death. We're going to few, play just a few seconds of it. But it's also clear that this is the worst Nirvana song of all times, and they would never have written anything, uh, something so terrible. And of course, Nirvana would not sound like this 27 years later. They would have developed and they would have prog progressed. So right now, AI mostly only imitates. It makes bad versions of the good things that we have made before it. It will do wonders for liberating a type design scene like for Hansi. It's a computer full of graphics cards that you need to have instead of a drawing office full of draftspeople. I think we don't need to fear that the type industry, the idea of making type-based products and then selling them is going to be disrupted by AI. Right now, the results are just not good enough. It's still a crazy amount of work and so on. Of course, that will change in the future and all of this is going to become much more accessible. I'm not saying that AI could never disrupt the type design industry. I'm saying it'll be too late and that our industry is already disrupted long before the AI even has its boot screen on. If you are the kind of designer who only makes the 4,000th geometric grotesque or the 5,000th flutigrest humanist to corporate sense, then, well, maybe you should be afraid or better you should become very good very quickly at selling those typefaces. Or also, see, maybe you need to rethink your life choices. But I really do believe that artificial, artificial intelligence as a tool, one whose infancy and glitchy nature can lead to surprising and unpredictable impulses, can, in due time, like all tools, give us new shapes and new expressions. New tools have always been developed and have been used to arrive at new possibilities, such as, for example, the pianoforte. Consider, for example, something else in popular music, Holly Herndon's last album, Proto. For me, that's currently one of the best examples of AI-aided composition and performance, uh, especially the song Godmother. I'm not going to play it right now because we're running a little long. 
Um, I especially like the song Eternal. You should check them both out. Both uh, heavily use an AI called Spawn that Holly Herndon designed and trained with her own vocal samples and with the vocal samples of a team of performers. Actually, you can see them training the thing in the beginning of the Eternal video. So, and this will this enables Spawn to augment and to participate with a very, very human performance uh, uh, and their voices that are so central to this album. In the end, when somebody says AI, we tend to hear only the intelligence part and not the artificial part. It means that we have created this. As Hernan puts it in a video she produced for Dropbox, the dirty secret of AI is that humans write the algorithm and produce or select the training data. That AI represents a vast amount of amassed human knowledge. Quoting Herndon in an article from Art News, AI is human labor obfuscated through terminology. And our goal is to use technology to allow us to be more human together. And that is my hope that we will find a wealth of new possibilities and expressions and in creatively used AI used a AI aided type design that go far beyond AI as imitator or AI as labor. Good tools have always, to paraphrase some old superpolator marketing copy, made difficult things easy and impossible things possible. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks to Ata Pai for having us all. Thank you to my great colleagues. Well, thank you, all four of you, for a fascinating talk um, that was not only very deep technically, but also uh, deeply reflective and beautifully explained throughout. Thank you, all four of you. Um, I have tons of questions in my own mind. Uh, I'm sure many of the audience do. Um, uh, we don't have time for many, uh, so I think we have to take take this to the hangout room for for reflection and, and discussion. Um, let's take a couple of questions that did come up in while while the speakers were on. Uh, Ollie Meyer uh, wonders uh, how come the low resolution was a better was a more use than the high resolution images. Can you would you mind addressing that quickly? Oh sure. Well, I can answer this question. Um, uh, well, uh, I will use two minutes to explain it, and uh, I will explain quick. So actually, for the uh, for the network um, we use, it's called VGG nineteen, and in the network it has a convolutional layer, pooling layer, uh, activation layer, etc. And with more layers, it has a higher uh, receptive field. And receptive field it means that one single pixel at a high level, it has um, it can cover uh, uh, a large part of the image. So uh, the higher it is, uh, the larger area it can cover. So this is called receptive field. And if the, if the, the resolution is very small, the network can capture the, uh, can extract the global structure very quickly. So it is faster to converge uh, in a training procedure. So that's why it, it, it works better compared with the larger resolution images. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll, we can get into more detail in the Hangout Room, I'm, I'm sure. Um, and, and Shiva Kalyan asks about the relevance of, uh, I think it's pronounced G2G, uh, a project which uh, we also, we, we also knows about. Uh, yes, for the Z2Z project, I can explain the difference between uh, what, we, what we did like because like in the very beginning of the presentation, I show this um, here. Ah, yeah, this project is from Zutuzi, and Zutuzi is using GAN to do the uh, transformation between different styles, and most mostly is focusing on the calligraphic ones. And but for us, we are more focusing on the body text, like. Um, to get the straight and the plain characteristic of the Hanzi. So we choose to use the uh, fine transformation first to adjust to 
the just the component to have a proper scale, then we maybe train a little bit to address the thickness of the uh, strokes maybe after. But yeah, the purpose is different between the two projects. And that was another thing you said that I found interesting. You said that the calligraphic approach was somehow easier to address with a GAN than the, the, uh, the, te the text type was, was a bigger challenge. Yeah, because for the GAN, it can generate some image like um, it did perfectly on like human faces because mm -hmm. uh, there are some tolerance about the image. Like if it's a 98% human face, then you recognize it as a human face. But for Thai face, it's like that. Even it's like 70% or 80% mm. Thai face, but you, you don't think they are the same thing, especially for the body text. But for the calligraphic style, the, there's natural tolerance about it. The calligraphic, it is more softener or like spiritual thing. <laughs> That's fascinating, uh, very well explained. I have one more question. How, before we move to the Hangout Room, which is, um, I think we'll have to pretty soon, how much of this is available for other researchers to follow up on their own? Um, is it open source? Is, is it published? Uh, for example, that um, Hanji database, uh, which had 90,000 rows, I think, of how to compose characters, is that a freely available thing? Or is that, are you keeping that within your project for the time being? It will be open sourced. That's amazing. That's yeah, they, there is a website uh, currently in the making that hopefully will be released, like let's say, in a couple of months with the with the database. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about how that database was put together. I think um, with that, unless there are any last quick questions. Um, Dave Crossland is asking, have you investigated how to apply machine learning to vector graphics? Again, if this is a big answer, maybe we can take it into the Hangout room. But uh, if there's a quick answer, please go for it. I have a little bit of a summary of an answer that I have from uh, Mathieu Zatzman, who has previously supervised the project uh, from EPFL, um, because that's also where we want to get. But um, the thing is that vector fonts will have, you know, different amounts of vector points, um, and therefore they create sort of a non-deterministic uh, problem. And that, at least so far, uh, and maybe potentially forever, the math just isn't there yet. Uh, maybe Wei has <laughs> has some additional information for that. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I have discussed about this with Shu Hui um, uh, several days ago about how to uh, do this stuff for the for the um, um, vector graphics. And one biggest challenge is that for the uh, for the same character for the same uh, for the same hands, you may have different um, uh, anchor points to define it. So this is a one to many question. So you have one hands and uh, Many uh, many anchor points that uh, many vector uh, points control uh, control uh, define these hands. So it, it is very complicated. And as you said, the math the mathematics uh, is not ready. So um, we will keep working on this. And this affine transform transformation is a good starting point because for the affine transformation, it does not only work on the images; it also work for the anchor points. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I guess the the discriminator would have difficulty saying that one vector is better than another vector if they look the same. Right, right. Um, I'm sure there's lots we can discuss about this, but let's move to the Hangout Room um, forthwith. And uh, this, it leaves me just to thank our presenters for a, fa a fabulous talk. Uh, thank you again, Wei, Shuhui, Mathieu, and Kai. And I, um, if, um, I'm sure there'll be lots of applause if, if we could turn all up, all turn our mics on. But thank you again. Thank you for your help, Lawrence. That was really uh, a great introduction. Uh, yeah, thanks. It was nothing. No. Anyway, see you in the Hangout Room. I'll post a link into the chat. But we